Okay, hello everyone, good evening. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Welcome to the Nantucket Land Council's fifth annual State of the Harbor Forum. A special thank you to the Land Council's Water Fund and Water Fund supporters who make all of our water programs, including these educational programs possible, as well as our sponsors tonight, Anderson Stillwater Moorings, the Nantucket Shellfish Association, as well as Steve Visco and Visco Pumping. I want to thank all of you for coming and also recognize that we have an audience out there in Zoom land, and I want to thank all of them for tuning in this afternoon as well. Um, I am going to take a minute just to walk you through what our program is going to be for the afternoon. When I'm done with the introduction, I will introduce our harbor master to talk a little bit about boat use and the work that she does with her department in our harbors. RJ Turcott, the Nantucket waterkeeper, is going to talk a little bit more about the Land Council's recent green boating campaign and also the marine resources that we're all working so hard to protect out there. We'll just touch a little bit on policy and regulations and then focus in on some more specific issues of concern that uh, Sheila, our harbor master, will walk us through. We'll talk a little bit about what we can all continue to do to contribute to protecting the health of our harbor. And I'm also going to invite the town's coastal resilience coordinator to come up at the end to share an update on the town's coastal resilience planning process before we get to our questions and answers. I will ask everyone to hold their questions till the end. And just a note for the folks who are out there on Zoom, you all will have a Q&A box on your screen. You're welcome to enter questions into that at any time. And we'll have RJ looking through those at the end of the program. So we'll be able to take some live questions as well as some over Zoom as well. So just a little bit of background. Most of you may be familiar with the Land Council. We primarily have worked as an environmental advocacy organization on the island since 1974. And while we really have increased our water focus the last 10 years or so, we had a, a pretty big emphasis on preserving the island's waters from the very beginning. And that included looking at our sole source aquifer, taking groundwater level measurements for the US Geologic Survey starting in the 80s, we also, back around 1990, contracted with a consulting firm, Horsley, Witten, and Hegman, to look at and evaluate our island's watersheds. And the watershed delineations that they created and mapped out in 1990 are the ones primarily that our island is still using today for a lot of our policies and decision making. So that may have been one of the more influential projects that the Land Council had worked on. We also worked in the late 80s and 90s with the town, health department, and marine department, and scientists from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, including Brian Howes, to do one of the primary baseline studies looking quantitatively at the health of the harbor in order to formulate a nutrient management plan going forward. And Brian Howes, as many of you may know, became pretty instrumental through his work with the state estuaries program at evaluating our harbors and estuaries and helping us establish nutrient management plans for many of them going forward. The Land Council has also been really supportive and involved in the town's policies on the harbor health um, all along. And we began these State of the Harbor forums back in 2017. I thought since this is our fifth year, I would just take a quick look back at where we've been. The first one was more of an overview of all of the different uh, factors influencing the health of our harbor resources. We looked at general water quality with the town natural resources department, as well as stormwater influences and boat use. We took a close look in 2018 with David Gray at the sewer main failure, which was a pretty hot topic at the time, if you all recall. In 2019, we had a few presentations on restoration projects taking place in the harbor. And last year, we focused a little bit more broadly on climate change and sea level rise impacts. And we did that one remotely. So this year, we're experimenting with a new hybrid program, offering people the option to tune in from home as well. I know we have a number of folks out there listening, but thanks to all of you for being here in person today. So our speakers, besides myself, as I mentioned, will be the Nantucket Waterkeeper uh, with the Nantucket Land Council, RJ Turcott, as well as Sheila Lucy, who is the town of Nantucket's Harbor Master. And then, as I mentioned, Vince Murphy, the Coastal Resilience Coordinator for the town, will give us a little bit of an update on his work at the end of the presentation. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Sheila to talk to us a little bit about boat use and the work that her department does. OK, um, so I'm going to start out with uh, the boat use 
Nantucket starts ramping up in mid-May, although it's been, it was earlier last year and this year, I think mostly because of COVID. People were working remotely and working different hours, so they wanted to put their boats in earlier, and also because it's a, it was a socially distance safe activity to do. So we saw a big increase in boating last year and this year earlier, like people were starting to call me in April, um, ask me where the buoys were and where things were. So um, we have approximately 40 ferry trips per day and we get three cruise ships per week that um, the launch, their launches offload at the uh, town pier. Um, we have 12 charter boats in Nantucket. We have two tour boats, two major boat clubs with approximately 15 boats. And we have one boat rental that's located at the Boat Basin with uh, six to eight boats. We have uh, 240 slips at the Boat Basin, 10 at the White Elephant, 88 recreational slips at the Town Pier, 125 rental moorings. And by the Army Corps of Engineers, we are permitted to have 1,800 um, private moorings. We are not at that number right now. We're lower than that uh, right now. Um, things typically wind down mid-October, but again, last year it extended longer, and I have a feeling the same thing is going to happen this year. Um, commercial scalloping starts on November 1st. Um, Moorings are required to be out of the water in scalloping areas on October 15th. It's one of our regulations um, that we enforce. Um, we've made some improvements because of all the water use, and some of our improvements are that we are really encouraging the use of four-stroke engines because they're more environmentally friendly. We have extended the no-wake zone. We've moved the no-wake zone out, so it's further from the horse shed. We have also been enforcing the no-wake zone, especially with the ferries and commercial traffic um, year-round instead of just seasonally. And it seems to have been working well. We also have put on no-wake buoy right by Brant Point. We also have another one up by First Point. So there should be no wake or speeding through the harbor once you get to First Point if you're coming down from Up Harbor or once you get inside the zone from just by the cut in the jetties all the way into the harbor. Six miles an hour is maximum speed limit and uh, no wake is acceptable. Okay, then we'll talk a little bit about uh, the Harbor Master's Office um, and myself. I was in the Coast Guard for 25 years. I retired as the officer in charge of Coast Guard Station Brant Point in 2007. I came to Nantucket in 2002. This is my 20th summer on Nantucket. Both in the Coast Guard and my current position, I have over 20 years of training and experience in uh, environmental protection and pollution response. Harbor Master's Office has four, four full-time personnel and 70 seasonal employees. We manage three harbors, 11 mooring fields, two anchorages, five navigable channels, three ramps and town landings, the lifeguard program, inshore search and rescue, and some other things that I'll get into in a minute. We are charged with the management and the physical labor for beaches. We provide the beach maintenance plan. We clean all town-owned beaches and assist the Land Bank and Conservation Foundation with their respective beaches in and off season. We maintain a beach hotline where people can call and report uh, any types of pollution or debris or something that needs to be cleaned up. We maintain the beach access signs um, for public safety. So there's signs on the beach. If somebody was to have an accident on the beach, there's a sign on the beach and a sign on the roadway for first responders um, to know exactly where they need to go to send either an ambulance, a fire truck, a police car, or whatever it may be. We've also put GPS positions on all of those in case we need a helicopter to land out there from the Coast Guard or if somebody is responding by boat um, it gives them the closest access to where they need to go. Um, we provide safety advisories to the public about beaches through our media, through um, 
Inky Alerts, and social media. We're in charge of the lifeguard programs. We have 55 lifeguards, and we lifeguard five guarded beaches, uh, nine guarded beaches, excuse me. Um, we provide, we have two year-round lifeguards on staff so that if something comes up in the wintertime, we have those two guys are available. They do the first aid and CPR, emergency medical responder training to lifeguards, dock staff, police, community service officers, and dispatch personnel. We perform maintenance on six buildings, 10 and 10 floating docks throughout the, throughout the island. We manage and maintain a 100 slip marina. We manage and maintain the only dinghy docks on the island. Town Pier hosts hundreds of transient vessels and is loading and unloading dock for the through three cruise ships per week. We maintain the oil pollution response plan for the island. We work with the Coast Guard, the DEP, the EPA, and local parties for oil pollution prevention and response. We conduct drills semi-annually with Harbor Fuel and our local partners. We made two oil pollution response trailers, boom, equipment, and anything else that's required by state, local, and or federal agencies. We work closely with the Coast Guard. We perform inshore search and rescue missions in Tuckanuck, Muskegon, Nantucket, up harbor. We do the uh, inshore stuff so that they can save their assets to respond to the bigger incidents that happen offshore. Although we are co we train with them regularly, so we can ask, act as a force multiplier to them, should we have a significant event with a ferry or some other catastrophic event out in Nantucket Sound. Maintain the pump out program. We maintain the boat and equipment. We operate 12 hours a day, seven days a week, from May 15th to September 15th. We document the pump outs and the program for grant opportunities and record keeping. We maintain and commission, decommission all the agents and navigation in the head of the harbor, Pulpus Harbor, Eel Point, Great Harbor Yacht Club Channel, Warren's Landing, Hither Creek, responsible for 96 agents to navigation. They have to be registered with the Coast Guard and NOAA. We mark, our, we mark all hazards, rocks, and no wake zones. Uh, we have 10 no anchoring buoys around Hussey Shoal that we maintain as well. We participate in state and federal waterways acts and register and license everything that we have with the Coast Guard. We enforce Nantucket bylaws, Massachusetts general laws pertaining to harbors, docks, piers, wharfs, pollution, and anything else that's applicable to the Harbor Master's authority. We manage inshore compliance with 1,800 private moorings, 125 rental moorings. We, pre we perform mooring inspections, approximately 250 annually, and we coordinate and train with eight separate mooring handling companies. We do public education. We conduct recreational safe boating classes to the public, and we license junior operators for the state of Massachusetts. We conduct regular uh, recreational safe boating patrols. And that's it, I think. That's everything? Are you sure? <laughs> Is it? First of all, congratulations on your 20th year, Sheila. That's awesome. Yep, yep. Okay, so I am Archie Turcott, the Nantucket Waterkeeper. Uh, that's a program under the Nantucket Land Council as of 2020. So as a little background on the waterkeeper movement, this started on the Hudson River um, when there was serious, serious industrial pollution a group of blue collar fishermen got together and uh, formed what was then the first river keeper ever. And their job was to be an advocate. So the state didn't want to help out with these issues and these water quality issues, these fishery issues. Federal government didn't want to help out. The local government didn't want to help out. So a group of fishermen got together and basically acted as their own attorney general and brought cases forward and helped bring the Hudson River back. And that was the first one. Um, it led to what is now over 300 nonprofit organizations from right here in Nantucket all the way to the Himalayas and the rivers that are flowing out of there. So a keeper can be a river keeper, a bay keeper, a lake keeper, really any body of water. The thing that the Alliance 
is created for is to have nonprofits that work together to protect one thing and one thing only, and that's clean water. That's swimmable, fishable, drinkable water for everyone. Not just a few, not just the people who can afford to live somewhere else, everyone. And it's really taken off. As you can see on this slide, um, we were the 354th waterkeeper group in 2020. Um, there's over 45 countries, I think every continent now, except for the one way south. Uh, over two and three quarter million miles of waterways protected. And the North Atlantic region now has 27 waterkeeper groups, including ourselves, over the nine states and 53,000 miles of waterways protected. And we all these waterkeeper groups um, work together. We meet every month and talk about these issues in our region. Every region has different issues. Uh, the Northeast has a lot of old infrastructure um, and a lot of legacy pollution, they call it. So our that little red rectangle on the slide is technically our jurisdiction. The other light blue ones are CAD render or GIS renderings of the other watersheds that are protected. Um, ours isn't on the map yet, so I just put a red rectangle with an arrow on it. So you can see Nantucket if you weren't familiar with where you are right now. The next slide, please. Okay, so water keepers, uh, it sounds really fancy. I don't have a badge. I don't have a cool pair of aviator sunglasses. I don't have any authority like Sheila does or like a police officer. What I am is the eyes and ears for the community. So if you see an issue that you think needs to be addressed, uh, feel free to reach out. Give me a call, send me an email, and we'll find a way to address it. Uh, they, you just heard Sheila rattle off all of the things that she has to do and all of the things she has to keep track of every year. And she's great. It's really amazing to be part of a waterkeeper group that doesn't have to have an, an adversarial relationship with the local government. Um, but she can't get to everything. She can't see everything. So that's where we come in. We try to be eyes and ears out on the water and we can't do it without you. We can't do it without members of the community who care and are out there and uh, want to address some of the issues that are, are going on. All right, so there's a few things that we are focusing on and specifically in Nantucket Harbor, we're looking at eelgrass decline. So eelgrass is a very, very critical species, a keystone species, a nursery. Um, for almost all of our beloved fish, crustaceans, shellfish in our waters. Uh, they are a carbon sink. They can take wave energy and wave action away during storms. And they're pretty critical. And unfortunately, up and down the East Coast, as well as all over the world, we're losing seagrass. So the Waterkeeper Program is focusing on the eelgrass in Nantucket Harbor, as well as Mattacut Harbor, and trying to A, monitor it, and B, trying to bring it back where we can and where it's possible. Um, invasive species are another one. We have a very robust species of green crabs, European green crabs here on Nantucket. Uh, they're very aggressive. They compete not only with each other, but with the local species. Uh, they love to eat baby scallops. They love soft shells clams, and they love ripping eelgrass out of the bottom, literally, just ripping it straight out of the bottom. So we're working to try to find a market for them and trying to find a use for them so that we can start to uh, bring that population down and help out our local species. Another thing that we're focusing on is harmful algal blooms. So this is something that seems to every year be getting worse and worse and every year we learn more and more about it. So 20 years ago, there weren't too many people talking about harmful algal blooms on ponds or in marine ecosystems. But now as the waters are getting warmer due to climate change and as we're learning more and more about these cyanobacteria species, uh, we're learning that they produce toxins. We're learning that they outcompete eelgrass and other local species and they're a problem. So we've been really focused on trying to address those issues. And of course, like every environmental group, we are grappling with climate change and sea level rise. And there are a few places where it's more difficult to deal with than a community that is surrounded by the Atlantic Ocean. So that is forefront on our minds. And lastly, on this slide, we are addressing plastics as well. So 
plastics were a great idea. We invented them 100 years ago, and we didn't really think about what was going to happen to them when we were finished with them. And every single piece of plastic we made since then is still with us. And we are working with the DPW, Nantucket DPW, as well as UMass Boston to monitor our beaches, take samples, and figure out exactly how much plastic uh, we're dealing with in our waters and on the beaches. And that's sort of just the tip of the iceberg for a small nonprofit. But those are some of the things that this program is focusing on. So this next slide is actually our jurisdiction. So it's kind of hard to see, but that blue outline, which extends five nautical miles off of Nantucket and goes all the way to Hyannis, that's our extraterritorial jurisdiction as a waterkeeper group. So any water resource issues or projects or anything like that that comes within that blue umbrella, um, which is about 700 square miles, we are the ones that the National Waterkeeper Alliance looks to to take the lead on. Um, it doesn't mean that we'll necessarily speak on every single thing going on in Hyannis, but as the group that is a Nantucket waterkeeper, we can. Our main jurisdiction is 131 square miles. It consists of all of the land Nantucket has, Muskegon, Tuckernuck, and one nautical mile extending offshore. So that's our main jurisdiction. That's where we do most of our restoration work, our monitoring work, um, and our advocacy work. So... Why do we care? Why do we spend so much time out on the water pulling green crabs out in pots and planting eelgrass? A community like this, our whole identity really is based on boats. When, unless you're flying here, which good for you, if you're not flying here, you're taking a boat, you're taking a ferry. And Nantucket Harbor is the first thing you see when you come in, and it's the last thing you see when you leave. And most of the big events every year go on out there. People from all over the world come in to anchor here and to come and explore downtown and see the Whaling Museum. But it all starts on the water. It all starts with our water resources. And without them, Nantucket would be like any other town in Massachusetts. So we are working really hard to try and preserve our number one resource here and keep it for not only the economy, but for future generations just to be able to enjoy and just be able to go fishing or wakeboarding or whatever it is that you're into. Take it away. All right. Thanks, RJ. So I just want to take a few minutes now to talk a little bit more about one of the primary aspects of our harbor resources that we've been focusing a lot on, both the land council and the town, I think the island as a whole, which is our, our eelgrass. And eelgrass, as RJ mentioned, is really a critical resource for a number of different reasons. The list of ecosystem services that eelgrass provides to us is pretty long. As he mentioned, it really provides the structure out there for that habitat and for that environment. I like to talk about it uh, in reference to the trees of a rainforest. If you think about all of the diversity, the biodiversity that you have in a rainforest, and then you imagine taking away the trees, taking away that structure and habitat, there's not a whole lot left of that ecosystem as far as support. And that's really the role that eelgrass plays for us in our harbors. It provides habitat, for the nursery, nursery for the fin fish, also obviously for our shellfish, certainly for our base scallops. It also is a great a resource for wave attenuation, as RJ mentioned, during storms. It really helps to buffer the shoreline from erosion and wave impacts. And also when you have a healthy eelgrass meadow, it helps to hold the sediment in place and really stabilize the harbor bottom, similar to how beach grass does a uh, coastal dune. It really has a similar impact on the bottom of our harbors. And then finally, there's more and more research going on that indicates that it's an incredibly important carbon sink for us these days. Um, and that's another thing that everyone's getting pretty excited about as far as trying to maintain the health of these habitats. So we're really concerned about eelgrass because there are also an equally long list of threats to its ongoing health and stability. Some of these are natural threats that are beyond our control. Mother nature, storms, significant storms. I'm sure we've all seen piles of healthy looking eelgrass washed up on the beach after a strong blow or um, some big waves and a, and a big storm surge. 
We also are dealing, as RJ said, with climate change and warming water temperatures. That's something that the Land Council's research has documented at this point, that the eelgrass in Nantucket Harbor is thermally stressed and that's not likely to improve anytime soon. So these are factors that are not necessarily directly in our control, but there are others that, that are in our control. And that's really why we're here today. In addition to nutrient pollution, some of our land use practices, which is something that this island and community has really gotten behind and focused on, Boating activities can also impact eelgrass. And we talk a lot about water quality and the importance of water quality, but there's also kind of a secondary impact of degraded water quality, which is that the overall health of the eelgrass starts to decline. So when you have activities such as fishing or anchoring or mooring that has a tendency to create a physical disturbance, at one point in time, that eelgrass may have been very resilient to those disturbances and maybe could regenerate and grow back pretty easily. But when you have a population of eelgrass that's really struggling to get enough light to photosynthesize, it's not going to be as resilient anymore. So water quality is important, but we're also starting to look at some of these other physical impacts from boating activities and invasive species such as green crabs. So we have been working a lot with the town in a pretty coordinated effort to monitor our eelgrass. Back in 2015, the Land Council worked to support the town's uh, aerial flyover to do some monitoring of eelgrass in sort of a big picture approach, looking at the distribution of the eelgrass beds. And that's when we were able to document up to a 30% loss of the extent of the eelgrass in Nantucket Harbor. We also have been working with some researchers out of Boston University on a health assessment throughout Nantucket Harbor, at more of a regional look of the health of the eelgrass meadows. And we moved that work over to Matticut Harbor last year as well. The town has been continuing some long-term research on the harbor health, looking at some different shellfish resources, as well as the eelgrass and the vegetation in the harbor bottom looking a little bit more site-specific and localized and monitoring the health of these specific areas over time. So it creates this three-tiered approach that really complements each other. And long-term, we're working to carry that forward so we can really document uh, the health of the eelgrass into the future. Many of you are aware that the Land Council began a eelgrass restoration project back in 2018 as an attempt to see if we could reestablish about a half acre of eelgrass off of Second Pier in Monomoy. This is an area where we know eelgrass had once existed uh, and had been a pretty healthy meadow out there, but we could see through aerial footage and also anecdotally had heard from some fishermen that after some significant nor'easters, there really seemed to be some shoaling events that buried that area with sand and the eelgrass just never really recovered. So we have been working to physically transplant eelgrass to that location. The harbor masters helped us out a lot there by helping to close it off to anchoring and to shell fishing while we've been doing the restoration work. It's been a pretty big collaborative effort. We've had a lot of support from the Town of Nantucket Natural Resources Department, from Anderson Stillwater Moorings, the sunken ship, and a whole lot of community volunteers who've come out to dive with us to physically do some underwater gardening. So this process is basically removing some shoots of eelgrass from a really healthy eelgrass meadow, Hussey Shoal, out in the middle of the harbor. And we really just break it off uh, at the rhizome without disturbing the parent plant. And we take those shoots and we bundle them together and we bring them over to Monomoy, to our transplant site, and we literally work along transects and we dig holes and we plant bunches of these eelgrass shoots to let them reestablish. Over the years, we've been looking at monitoring this area with uh, survival in general, things like shoot density, percent cover, the canopy height of the eelgrass that's there, and the results have really been quite good. 50 to 60% survival might not sound great, but when it comes to this type of eelgrass transplant and restoration, it's about as good as you can expect. So we're really pretty pleased to see this level of success six and 12 months out. One of the reasons that we suspect we're getting and achieving the success is because the area <coughs> has been closed to anchoring and shell fishing. And we think that it's helped to just enable it to recover both vegetatively and allowing seeds, seed production um, restoration in there as well. 
So I actually pulled a few stills from a monitoring video we have. This white disc was used with a GoPro camera under a boat in order to take a look at eelgrass density. You can see just on the other side of the transect line, just some small clumps of eelgrass that had just been planted this season. And there's a couple more. That's sort of what the area looks like right after we've been down there planting some eelgrass. And then farther along the transect, you start to get into areas that were planted six months, 12 months, 18 months before, where these areas are starting to actually coalesce and vegetatively grow, fill in with seed as well from the surrounding area. And this is eventually what we want to happen to this entire half acre area and beyond. So we are really pleased. We're seeing a lot of this um, success and we're going to continue to work on that into the future. We also are working with the town's natural resources department now to experiment with some seeding options as well. We've been out and harvested some reproductive plants with seeds that the natural resources department is storing for us in a flow through tank at the hatchery. And when those are mature later in the season, we'll be putting them out using a variety of techniques in the same area to experiment with actual seeding. And it's important for us to play around with some of these different methods as tools in the toolbox. So when we think about eelgrass impacts in different parts of the harbor, we have a sense of what is available to us as a means to help to restore these areas in the future. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to RJ to talk a little bit more about our green boating campaign that the Land Council is working on this year. All right, awesome, thank you, Emily. So. There were some drone shots in the beginning of the presentation showing basically winter when the harbor's empty right into summer, right into this time of year and into August where we have, you could almost walk across the harbor, the number of boats that are anchored or moored in there. And fortunately, boats have come in an extraordinary way in the last 20, 30, 40 years. They are not the black smoke belching, oil leaking, breaking down, sinking, scuttling, old boats that we imagine that you see in Jaws and movies like that. These are very efficient, very well-made, new machines that follow pretty strict regulations. Uh, one of the biggest ones, which I think Sheila will touch on later, is, is switching to a four-stroke instead of a two-stroke motor for the outboards, which is the majority of the motors out here. And they've come a long way. They really have. Um, but with so many in the harbor, we still see environmental impacts. And at this point, it's getting down to the nitty gritty. It's getting down to the detail work. It's getting down to properly maintaining your boat and making sure that it's running the way it was intended to when they built it. Because uh, that's when you start to run into some of the environmental issues that uh, cause problems for our eelgrass and some of our other species. So we started a campaign, uh, the Waterkeeper program, this spring through June, just basically going over some of these really basic things that uh, basically come with your owner's manual if you still have it. So the first one is when you're cleaning it, especially if it's on the water, avoid using harsh solvents. Um, you can use vinegar and you be surprised how much you can get off just using a good old scrub brush and some water. You can even use baking soda, um, but you don't need to use anything too harsh or too uh, stringent because that just runs straight off your boat into the harbor. Uh, the next ones are paint for both the bottom and top sides of your boat. So the old bottom paints used to be really toxic. They used to have metals in them. Um, they're moving away from that. They're coming up with formulas that do their job without actually being as toxic and they're a lot slicker and they prevent marine growth to grow on there. Um, so those are options. They are expensive, but uh, it's pretty complex chemistry and they are worth it. Um, and then painting your top sides as well using a non-oil based polyurethane paint that can hold up to UV damage is really helpful and will actually improve the uh, longevity of your own boat. Uh, this one basically... If you're a sailor, or even if you have a motorboat, if you do not keep your boat bottom clean, you are really, really, really going to kill the performance of your boat. You're gonna use more fuel, and that's bad for the environment as well. So keeping that bottom clean and keeping growth, barnacles, algae, all that good stuff off it really helps, not only for you to get where you're going and have a good time, but to use less fuel, which is good for the environment. Keeping your engine well-tuned, this one again, these are very basic. Um, 
tune-ups every year allow you to use less fuel and run more effectively and make sure you don't have any leaks and gear oil going into the harbor, things like that. Number six, I believe. So this is another one that unfortunately we have to tell people pretty frequently is to follow the no wake zones. So when you come into a constricted channel, your wake can not only rock boats that are moored and sometimes cause them to break free, but it can also cause calving of salt marshes and eroding of the shoreline. So slowing down once you're into these no wake zones is pretty critical environmentally. Anchor responsibly, this is a pretty easy one as well. If you have the proper ground tackle on your boat and your anchor is heavy enough and you have the proper scope of line and chain, uh, your anchor won't drag, your boat will stay in place. And especially as Sheila mentioned earlier, Hussey Shoal and our restoration areas, um, do not anchor those in those areas. Those are areas that have good eelgrass and that we're trying to um, bring back and anchoring properly and using the proper equipment will really go a long way in the other areas where you are allowed. Um, don't dump into the harbor. That one's an old one that's pretty well enforced. Um, we do our best to keep the trash in the harbor to a minimum, but definitely clean up after yourselves. Um, keep gray and black water out. So modern boats now, they're moving away from having a separate gray water tank, but any sewage or anything you use to wash your dishes on board, things like that, um, should be pumped out. And there are many pump out options, which Sheila will cover later, that don't cost you anything. All you have to do is hail them on the radio. Um, bilge water is another one. Um, so you can put in a bilge sock like this one, and it'll absorb any of the fluids that your boat's leaking um, before you pump it out into the harbor. So that's another easy one. Great. Thanks, RJ. I think now we're just going to ask Sheila to briefly mention some of the regulations that are applicable to us here on Nantucket and then just move into a few specific topics of concern. Okay. So like we said before, we, uh, we enforced uh, no dis it's a federal no discharge zone and uh, we enforce that. Um, we also enforce the Nantucket bylaws for moorings, anchorages, uh, pollution response, anything like that, as well as the Massachusetts state laws. So if we do have some type of an event, we will involve the Coast Guard, so they will get ticketed federally, we will ticket them through the state, and we will ticket them locally um, if we do have a pollution event. We have had two so far this summer. Both of them have been gasoline, um, which evaporates very quickly, and you're not supposed to boom gasoline off. You're just supposed to let it dissipate with the tide, which is, which is what happened. Um, but we have taken enforcement action along with the Coast Guard on both of those vessels. Um, okay, I'm talking to anchoring first. Okay. So anchoring. So as I said, we set the te 10 no anchor buoys around Hussey Shoal. We enforce it in their uh, restoration areas. You cannot anchor past first point in a vessel that's greater than 30 feet, and no vessel can anchor past first point overnight. Um, we do let people go up inside the bends and day trip and uh, have lunch, have a picnic, do whatever they do, they can anchor. Then, but if they're over 30 feet, we tell them they cannot, they cannot be in there. Um, we have advertised our no anchor zones with NOAA, uh, the Coast Guard. Uh, it's in the, it's in, and it's in the Coast Pilot, in all kinds of sailing magazines. I've reached out to everybody we can think of to tell them if they see those no anchor uh, buoys that we we mean business, and that is. It is not acceptable for them to anchor in those areas. The anchorage usually doesn't get stupid until August. Um, so we're still a little bit ahead of schedule, but we end up getting a lot of big boats and a lot of, um, that's when we really have to work at it to keep everybody in the areas that <laughs> we want to keep them. If you've noticed lately, a lot of the Huge, huge mega yachts are now anchoring outside um, by, you know, off the North Shore. And there's a lot of North Shore residents that are not happy with that, but 
We are, because they're not in harbor. Yeah, it's eight, they're in. Okay, and we're gonna talk about pump out. Okay, we're on the water, as I said, 12 hours a day from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. from May 15th to September 15th, unless the weather is absolutely horrifying. We pump, annually we pump between 25,000 and 30,000 gallons of black and gray water. Combined with the Nantucket Bolt Basin, we pump between 75,000 and 100,000 gallons annually. The Nantucket Bolt Basin has a, a system where the big boats can just uh, pipe right in to the system. They also have a cart that rides around and provides pump outs. We have a, the Headhunter, which is our pump out boat. We have just ordered a second pump out boat and we have a portable pump that we could put onto a third boat should, should we need to. Um, we also have a dockside pump. There's a dockside pump at um, Mattakit Marine and there's a dock side pump down at, um, well, it's a portable one down at the Great Harbor Yacht Club. Um, one thing that we've done this year that we have never done before, but uh, we used to do it, I guess, during big, um, big events, but we just purchased 8,000 dye tabs um, for the Nantucket Bolt Basin to give to their customers and also for us to give to the people on their moorings and on in, in the anchorages. So, and what that, what'll happen there is if they pump illegally over their side, we'll see it and we'll know exactly where to go. As I said, the head hunters out there every single day, every boat's gonna be issued one of those and we'll be keeping a lookout for them. So I feel like that's a, a big improvement um, for this year. Um, yep, there's the head hunter. And then what was the next conclusion response? Morning. Oh, morning. Okay, well, I'll just talk about, we do the, I, I already talked about it a little bit. We do the pollution response. We maintain the pollution plan. And um, if we have a report, like I said, we contact DEP, the Coast Guard, and we ourselves will go out and we'll take a look at it. Next topic is moorings by the Army Corps of Engineers. We are authorized to have 1,800 moorings. As I said, we have not issued, we do, currently do not have 1,800 in. We did not issue any moorings. We have not issued any moorings since 2019. Um, we didn't issue any during COVID and we just haven't had time to issue any this year. We're taking a good look at it and where we're gonna let them go and what they're gonna do. We're testing several environmentally friendly moorings. Um, currently, our, you know, everybody thought the answer was helix moorings. The helix moorings that we used on Nantucket are not the answer. You still have the chain scour. It's just uh, the helix is down and it has chain attached to it, so it's just like having an anchor. The only difference is you can't pull a helix. So, in my opinion, it's a huge safety concern for our scallopers. Um, if they get, you know, pulling their dredges along and they get hooked up into a helix that doesn't have a cap on it, it could pull them down by the stern, swamp them, and cause some significant issues for them. So what we're working on is a, um, it's a Dyneema type of a line that floats, has no chain, attached to a, a pyramid anchor, Pyramid Anchor has incredible holding power. That's what the Coast Guard and we use for our buoys because the holding power is so much greater than, than a mushroom anchor or a, or a concrete block or something like that. So we're working with that and we're gonna set uh, a couple of them. We're gonna put a town boat on them. They're gonna put their boat on it and we're gonna see, see how we do. But um, we, we're, we're constantly talking to people just to get some guarantees on, on the right way to do this. Great, thank you, Sheila. You're welcome. Really appreciate all those comments and thoughts on those issues. Those are some of the big ones, I think, um, and maybe we'll get to talk some more about those a little bit later on. So I just wanted to recognize some of the organizations here on island that are particularly involved with our harbor resources Obviously, the Harbor Masters Department and the Town of Nantucket's Natural Resources Department. 
Also, the Harbor and Shellfish Advisory Board, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment, uh, our Waterkeeper Program, and the Nantucket Shellfish Association, who's particularly focused on the health of the harbor resources and the shellfish, as well as supporting the local fishermen. So I just want to take a moment to point out the work that the Harbor and Shellfish Advisory Board is doing and that they are out there. They're not necessarily a resource that uh, everyone is aware of. They're not regulatory in nature. They were established more as an advisory board. And their focus or their mission is really to try to help ensure appropriate access as well as balanced uses and the preservation of our water and the health of our marine resources. They, their purpose is really to support and make recommendations to town officials in policy and regulatory matters or uh, planning processes that are relevant to the harbor. They have regular meetings. There's a lot of expertise on their board. So they're another resource for the public, I think, as far as raising issues for further discussion and deliberation that could then lead to potential recommendations for policy changes in the future. I know a couple of their members are here, so maybe we'll we can hear from them if anyone has questions about their work. And then I would be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about some of our local harbor policy. The Nantucket and Mattacat Harbors Action Plan was approved by the state in 2009. And this is um, a document that took inventory of all of our harbor resources, as well as the important uses that the community has for, for uh, our harbors. The purpose was really to help to establish goals and to make recommendations around policy and regulation that addressed all interests in the harbor, uh, boat use, um, environmental protection. And that the result of that harbor plan was then the, the production and implementation of the shellfish management plan. There was a harbor plan implementation committee who worked over many years to try to see that a lot of these recommendations were implemented. And there certainly were some policy and regulatory changes that came about as a result. So this plan now that it's more than 10 years old is due to be updated. And the town is looking to begin that process, I believe, next year. And I think it will be a great opportunity for members of the community and the public to get involved in discussions around how we're managing our harbor resources uh, and any potential recommendations or changes. So I know the Land Council is looking forward to participating in the process, and I just think it's something that the community should be aware of. I think it'll be a great opportunity for us to just take a closer look at how we're managing our harbors. And with that, I will just turn it back over to RJ to throw out a few reminders about what we can all do. All right, thank you, Emily. So there are a lot of issues that we're dealing with, and there's a lot of people out here, uh, but we're optimistic. We can have our cake and eat it too, as funny of a saying as that is. Um, we can have all these boating activities. We can go fishing. We can go shell fishing and also have good water quality and have eelgrass and have scallops and all those good things. Um, so we are always looking for volunteers to help us out with the eelgrass project, with the water quality projects, all that stuff. Um, pictured here is sensors that we have set up around both harbors. Uh, they're in the water. This one's a control sensor, so it's actually on a marsh, and they monitor light and temperature, and we can figure out exactly what the eelgrass is, ex is experiencing, and we know exactly what they can tolerate. Um, so that's one. Practice green boating, so not to... Um, plug our own campaign from this spring, but keep your boat well tuned, keep the bottom clean, use environmentally friendly products. Um, these are the details that will really help if we're all pulling in the same direction, especially when uh, there are so many boats in the harbor. They are efficient, they run clean, but uh, you do need to maintain them. Um, and as a waterkeeper program, if you guys are out there and you see something, say something. It, has been said a million times before for a lot of issues. Um, a few weeks ago, we had someone send us an email with this photo. Um, they were concerned that some sort of petroleum was leaking into the harbor. Uh, I went out, it turned out to be benign, it was just a seep. Um, but we'd rather hear from you if you have a concern than uh, let it go unchecked. Um, so if you do see an issue, let us know and we'll work to address it. 
So another thing is to stay engaged in the community. There are public meetings going on almost every week. Um, we're working on updating the wetlands regulations, working on the harbor plan. There's a coastal resilience plan, which we'll get to in a little bit. Uh, there are so many ways for you guys to get involved and have control over how our water resources are managed and are being used. And we want to hear from you. We want to hear your voices. Um, the more the merrier because we're all stakeholders and we're all using these resources. So it's important to hear from you. And if you can't make it, um, you can write a letter. Uh, let us know. We're at these, Emily, myself, we're at these meetings and we can comment uh, as well. So really in any way you can advocate for preserving our marine resources and water quality, do so. Every little bit helps to get us over the line. Thanks, RJ. Okay, so before we actually get to question and answer time, I just wanted to uh, take this opportunity to introduce Vince Murphy, who's the town's coastal resilience coordinator. It's hard not to it's hard to talk about the harbor and not bring up the coastal resilience planning work that the town is doing right now. So I've just asked Vince to provide a little update on where the planning process is at, and also a little reminder of how the community can have some input and be involved. Thank you very much, Emily. Can everyone hear me okay? Is this all right? Okay, I'll speak as loudly as I can, and I might have to go a little bit lower than normal towards the microphone. So, obviously, uh, for those that don't know me, I'm Irish. Uh, I do have a bit of a problem with an accent. Uh, if you have any questions or can't understand me, just raise a hand, and uh, I'll try and make myself clear. We've had a lot of discussion about uh, water appreciation so far, so let's keep it going and let's not be scared by the ideas of sea level rise, we can adapt. Last year I gave an outline uh, of how uh, the CRP might unfold and this year I've been asked to come back and say what we have done in the last uh, nine-ish months of working to develop a CRP for uh, the county. So at the start of almost every meeting I always re read the um, project mission statement uh, as we have up here. And if you don't mind, I'll just take a moment to say uh, that it draws on the cherished, built and natural heritage of Nantucket to create a community supported roadmap to implementation for a series of layered flood controls and adaptions and adapt adaption approaches and coordinate with ongoing adaptions and sustainability initiatives to address the whole island and county. That's important. It's not just the uh, Nantucket, it's whole county. While rep Res uh, respecting the unique characteristics of each neighborhood. Driven by the inclusive and equitable engagement of all, the plan aspires to create social, environmental, and economic benefits and values to everyone who will share in Nantucket's future. So this Coast Resilience Plan uh, is being undertaken by a group of consultants, uh, namely Arcadis uh, are the main consultants with uh, sub-consultants, Stoss, One Architecture, and the Craig Group. And we also have to uh, acknowledge and, and fully thank um, that the, the fact that the town, uh, this town project has been also overseen by uh, the Coastal Resiliency Advisory Committee with the acronym CRAC. Uh, and I have to give particular thanks to the chair of that committee, Mary Longacre, who has done exceptional and diligent work over the last year. Uh, next slide, thank you. So we have to look at what the Coastal Resilience Plan might cover. The goal of the CRP is to develop a comprehensive plan for the whole island that addresses coastal erosion, coastal flooding, and sea level rise. Sea level rise will make both erosion and flooding, coastal flooding, worse over time. If it's bad now, it'll be worse in 10 years and worse again in 40. Next slide, please. We have to look at where we are in the timeline of the development of a coast resilience plan. Uh, before the last state of the harbour, we were just in the process of hiring consultants. The consultants began work in September 2020 and uh, they had a project kickoff and project initiation. There was a very large community engagement approach. Uh, and at the time, they also began uh, a coastal risk assessment. The coastal risk assessment culminated in the development of a mid-project report uh, in April. From there, they were able to use what risk we know about to start developing adaption strategies, and then from there, look how they might be implemented. 
So we have about two and a half months left uh, in the development of the CURP. The mid-project report gave us some particularly clear insights that I'd like to very quickly and briefly go through. There were three and a half thousand or nearly three and a half thousand structures that were identified to be at risk between now and 2070. It identified 1.2 billion, billion with a B, 1.2 billion dollars in cumulative expected damages. That is everything from repetitive loss to uh, losses in catastrophic events. Uh, they also identified that 86% of the buildings at risk are residential and about 7% of the buildings at risk are commercial. 41% of the buildings at risk are historic. We have to bear in mind that one of the reasons why Nantucket is famous not only for water but is for the historic character and historic charm uh, that the island has and they must also remember that the Nant Nantucket is a national historic landmark. So we now know the risks and what's at risk. It's now time to start looking at solutions. Uh, we, uh, on June 24th, we had the second of our virtual open house events where consultants and members of the public uh, came together to start that conversation. How would that look? So we looked at solutions along the lines of raising roads for access to critical infrastructure, such as the um, uh, steamboat wharf uh, for the Steamship Authority, which is the single most at-risk structure on Ireland. We also looked at how beach nourishment might increase longevity and how other types of erosion control, such as planting beach grass and other types of green infrastructure might work towards um, slowing erosion rates. We don't know that we can ever stop them fully but we can certainly start to slow them down. One of the projects um, that has recently been undertaken out at Millie's Bridge, where with many people who volunteered, I think we had something in the order of 27 people who volunteered on the day, we planted 0 0.7 of an acre of beach grass, and that area is now stabilized so that once uh, the dune starts to erode, it'll erode more slowly. The plan has a general emphasis on green infrastructure. So we have traditional hard infrastructure, you might just think concrete, something that we, uh, we heard from the public that most people want to avoid where possible, particularly in the downtown area. Some of the things that came up while talking to the public were looking at ideas for uh, hybrid infrastructure, such as some maybe some element of green infrastructure with, uh, of, sorry, of traditional infrastructure with green infrastructure on top of it that can look more in keeping with Nantuck Nantucket's aesthetics. One of the final things we were talking about at the most recent uh, set of solutions was a, a toolkit for homeowners. This could be a myriad of measures, but one of the most basic ideas is to raise homes where needed, particularly in flood zones. So, we had a very large look at what can be done, what can be done legally, and also we also have to understand for the CRP to be successful, we have to be, this all has to be done in mind with what is acceptable to the community. Thank you. Thanks, Vince. I definitely appreciate taking the time for the update. There uh, certainly is still an opportunity for public input and community input. I think if anyone has any specific concerns relative to the Coast Storage Lanes planning, reach out to Vince. You can find his contact on the town's website. Um, and at this point in time, I just want to open it up to some questions, discussion, comments from the public. We can certainly take some um, questions here in person, and then I'll also have RJ looking on Zoom to see if there are any that come in there. Meg's got a, an extra microphone up here. Does anyone have any questions or comments that they want to make? Mm -hmm. Meg, there's... Um, uh, we'll, we'll just get you the microphone for the, the, the recording, if you don't mind. Oh. Or maybe we'll steal one from the front table. Um, okay, is it working? Okay. Uh, I'm Buzz Goodall. I just had uh, a question. Over the years, we've heard a lot about the damage that stormwater runoff does, and I haven't seen anything here about that. Are we making progress? Are we giving up? What's going on? 
So the question, I think everyone probably heard that just fine, but the question is about stormwater runoff as a source of pollution to Nantucket Harbor. And yes, thank you for bringing that up. That's definitely something that we raised as a real topic of concern at our first State of the Harbor Forum back in 2017. And no, I would say that we definitely haven't given up on that. Um, the process for improving and uh, the infrastructure that we have down around town in the harbor is um, a long one. It's um, the town is definitely creating some priorities as far as beginning to look at some of the outfall pipes and areas. And um, I know at the town pier near the Washington Street parking lot where some um, reconstruction has already been done of the outfall as the town pier was rebuilt. Uh, to bring the outfall farther back to a place where it won't get so buried and inundated constantly and where there in the future will hopefully be room for some more infiltration and bioremediation upgrading of that outfall. The process is just quite slow. Down at Children's Beach, there has been some um, work, design work being done with the pump station down there that has experienced some inundation during flooding events. Um, some of you might be quite familiar with. And so there are also, the town's also in the process of working with some engineers to look at options for redesigning the pump station and how to build it with capacity and in a location that will still be functional in 20 to 50 years or beyond with uh, sea level rise and storm surges that we're anticipating. So it definitely is still a concern. The Land Council is looking at and has been having discussions with the DPW on what which outfalls downtown we can move forward with trying to put in some automatic sampling equipment so that we can start to look a little bit more closely at the quality of the water that's leaving these outfall pipes. Some of the challenges we ran into with that infrastructure and even sampling it was access uh, because of where the outfalls are located. So it's definitely still on our radar. It is on the town's radar, um, but it's just very slow moving. But it's a great topic that I think is something we should talk more about and maybe include as a focus point in the future. Thank you. Any others? Hi, my name's Andy Lowell. I'm uh, just entering my seventh year on the Harbor Shellfish Advisory Board, my third term. I'd like to thank the voters in Nantucket for trusting me with the third term. This is our secretary of the Harbor and Shellfish Advisory Board, Peter Brace. He's been the longest member of the Harbor Shellfish Advisory Board uh, on your 11th year, I believe, Mr. Brace. Um, I'd just like to mention that we at the Harbor Shellfish Advisory Board are a well-rounded board. I'm very proud of our board members. There's seven of us. They all have bring in their unique uh, approach to things and their, their unique, uh, uh, just uh, the way we talk about things. It all kind of comes together and melds very well. We maintain a very good relationship with the Harbor Master, with the, shell, uh, the Natural Resources Department and the uh, Shellfish Hatchery. And uh, we have a list of accomplishments and things that we're working on uh, that we're proud of as well. We're here for the fishermen, we're here for the public, and uh, we're here for our environment, and we're here for the island. I feel all of us, accumulatively, we love the island, and we love our harbor, and without the harbor, it's probably hard to imagine loving the island. So it's very important. Uh, the, the issues that the harbor faces, I believe, uh, as uh, Natural Resources Director Jeff, Tur or Jeff uh, Carlson mentioned, I think two years ago, he mentioned this, there is no silver bullet. Uh, the problems that we face are cumulative and uh, multifaceted. So uh, I, I really would like to thank the decades of service that the Land Council has provided to the island for its environment. Uh, I have to say, as growing up here as kind of a rebel native son, when the uh, land council first came, came on board in 1974, it was kind of difficult uh, for somebody who was used to simple freedoms to accept. 
Now as I've somewhat matured with age, I, I look at them today and I think how proactive they've been and just what a wonderful contribution they've been to this island, how lucky we are to have them. And thank you to all the supporters who have brought them here today, especially the Shellfish Association, which I'm also a member of, and the Moorings uh, and wh whoever else that you saw who the, uh, uh, the sponsors were, and thank them all for helping the Land Council get here. Mr. Brace is going to share with you some of our accomplishments over the past few years. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. <clears throat> Okay, so um, you guys hear me when I just talk like this? No. Okay. Okay. Um, I just got a really deep voice, so I'm going to drown myself out. Uh, so primarily, we are about uh, protecting shellfish. Um, you may have heard of us as called Shab. That's incorrect. We are the Harbor and Shellfish Advisory Board. When we are not uh, advocating for the protection of shellfish directly. Um, some of the things that we've worked on and things that we are still working on. Uh, we collaborated with the Nantucket Shellfish Association to produce a, uh, I think it's around 8x10 sticker that will be on all dumpsters around the island, um, sort of warning people not to dump toxic materials into the dumpsters, which of course leak the material into the ground and possibly into um, storm drains. We're exploring an idea of micro dredging of eelgrass beds to try and remove some of the sand from the harbor. Um, we are working with our harbor master, Sheila Lucy, modifying the liveaboard regulations to make the liveaboard uh, owners more accountable so when their boats fall apart and spread themselves around the harbor, we'll have some of to come and pick it up. Uh, we are trying to get the town to uh, build a has as material containment, containment building. Um, we are, I think, didn't we, Andy, get more hazardous material collection days? No? We did get the town to add two collection dates, but they have not added those to the calendar yet. So there are still only six collection dates per year for hazardous material collection. Uh, we would like to actually see a building where hazardous waste can be brought to at least three days a week. Okay, and we are also supporting uh, the oyster farmers out here. As some of you may know, oysters process uh, quite a bit of water, I think up to 50 gallons of water each a day. Um, and they process a lot out of the pollution out of the water. We support also the Pulpus Oyster Reef um, in front of Medui Creek. And uh, we are, in, like with Sheila, advocating for environmentally um, friendly moorings. And then we worked a lot with Sheila this summer. I'm sorry, this winter. She helped us reach out to the uh, fast ferry um, companies to get them to slow down as they go by the horse shed. And if you don't know where that is, directly across uh, Brant Point, if you're looking right at Co2, that's called the horse shed. Uh, it's a eelgrass bed, scallops are there, and when the ferries pull out of the harbor really fast and come in really fast, their um, water jets, the fast ferries spread sand and, and fill that in. We're trying to get them to slow down. And then the only other thing I wanted to say is that the Nantucket Land Council, myself, and a few other people produced a document a few years ago called uh, the Nantucket Blue Pages. It's a uh, water quality protection document about 60 pages long. The Land Council has them on the way out. You should all get one. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Pete. Does anyone have any other questions here or RJ? Do you want to take a look at Zoom and let us know? Steel Sheila's mic here. Yes, we have one question. So this gentleman said, you talked about the rising temperatures in the harbor. When we think about sea level rise and climate change, we often talk more about the impacts on historic buildings, structures, roads, and shorelines. But what do we need to consider regarding the health of the harbor in relation to sea level rise and climate change? You want me to take that one? Okay. 
So I think initially when folks who come out here thought of sea level rise and climate change, it was really easy when you step down the gangway off the ferry to see all these buildings that are right up against the water. Uh, but we really have been pushing for folks as um, I'm sure Vince could speak to you, um, with the coastal resilience plan to focus on green infrastructure when we're looking at coastal resilience rather than typical hardening and gray infrastructure um, and restoring things like eelgrass beds that can attenuate wave energy and prevent you from needing to put as aggressive a structure in front of your home. Um, so Considering the health of the harbor, temperature, unfortunately, is sort of out of our hands. Um, it's one thing that we really don't have any control over. It's not like we can put chillers like you can in an aquarium in the harbor. It's just too big. So we're focusing on other things. Um, the sensors I showed earlier in the slideshow, those are light and temperature sensors. And if we see that there isn't enough light getting down, we know that the water column uh, has too much in it. And it's typically algae. Um, and that's something we can address through addressing stormwater runoff, like we already talked about, addressing harmful alga blooms, and making sure that uh, the community is meeting the state uh, mandated total maximum daily loads, TMDLs, that are coming into the harbor. Um, so we are working on those things. And I think the structures, like downtown especially in those historic structures do get a lot of the headlines but um, it's been a pretty comprehensive look at how all of Nantucket is going to have to handle uh, rising temperatures and rising seas. Thanks RJ. Um, so I think just to sort of reiterate something that Andy said, quoting Jeff Carlson from a couple of years ago, that there is no silver bullet. One of the reasons that we're here today talking about boat use is because, as we mentioned previously, there are so many different factors affecting the health of our harbor, of our eelgrass, of uh, the resources that are out there. And we're really looking to hone in on some of those factors that are under our control, uh, where we can really contribute to the ongoing protection of these resources. And one of those is certainly boat use. So um, if, are there any other questions? If not, maybe we will wrap up. And I know I'm sure RJ and Sheila and I will stick around for a little while if anybody wants to, to chat afterwards. But um, just want to thank again the Land Council's Water Fund and Water Fund Founder Circle, our uh, town departments, the Harbor Master and Natural Resources Department that the Land Council works really closely with on these issues. We also had a great anonymous contribution that supported uh, a lot of the uh, drone photography that you saw in the presentation today. We've been able to document what's going on in the harbor seasonally throughout the course of the year with a couple of local drone photographers, Gretchen Callahan and um, Preston Harmon of Gray Lady Aerials. And then the Nantucket Yacht Club, of course, and NCTV and our sponsors, Anderson Stillwater Moorings, the Shellfish Association, and Steve Visco and Visco Pumping. So just want to thank everybody for being here with us today, and um, we look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you. Thank you.